it's a tough job because I'm the guy that has to tell the best shooter that ever lived that it's not good enough. This is Brandon Payne. I am Stephen Curry's personal performance and skill coach, and I've been working with him for almost a decade now. When I looked at the landscape of players in the NBA, there was only one player that I wanted to work with, and that was Stephen Curry. When Steph and I first got together, he was actually coming off of an ankle surgery. So the first big ankle surgery that he had in the NBA. And at that time, it was all about modifying drills, modifying movements to make sure we were doing it safely and trying to build that back up. I'm not the reason he's gotten better. Stefan is the talent. I'm the guy that just throws a little bit on top, you know, a little seasoning on top of the steak is what I like to say, you know, just to help him out. I started coaching at the college level when I was still in college. And one of the things that I had to do was not only the strength conditioning part, because at that level of basketball, you don't have a very big budget, but I also had to handle a lot of our skill work. So figuring that out then kind of led me to experimenting with different drills. And then it got me wanting to learn more about how the body learns. Uh, how your brain and muscles communicate, uh, how to activate things, and just basically how to create more efficient workouts to get the biggest bang for our buck. So strength conditioning, it used to be kind of a general term that we use for lifting weights and getting stronger, but now strength conditioning involves so much more, including just the ability to be mobile in your joints, flexible in your muscles. That's such a big part of what we do because if we don't have fluid movement, it's really hard for players to take the things that we're showing them from a skill standpoint and actually put it into games. Like right now in our off-season progression with Steph, we're not even really to a point to where we're lifting. We're still working on mobility. We're still working on corrective actions from little injuries that happened during last season. Because we don't want things we do on the floor to be done at, at the incorrect time because we're actually building incorrect movement patterns. We actually do have some technology that will let us know each day what the optimal training window will be based off of central nervous system feedback. And so we do use that to tell us what time of day to train can tell you like your window from three to five is your strongest window today. I'm trying to get him in and out in 90 minutes, 90 minutes to two hours. So he'll work out three consecutive days. He'll take one day off. As we start to ramp up his movement in terms of how much he's running each day in our drills, we'll probably switch and go to a two day on, one day off. And that one day off won't be completely off. It'll be a strictly recovery day. And then as you get closer to the season, we'll probably take about four or five days consecutively off, give him another mini vacation. Then we'll go for about five straight days prior to training camp. And then he's with the Warriors. And we're looking for as many ways as we can to have him improve without putting any additional miles on his body. So, you know, virtual reality is something we've started adding in on days where he's strictly recovery. So now we're going to talk about some of the tennis ball and basketball drills we go through with Stefan and some of our other NBA players. So we start with some basic tennis ball stuff and then we progressively overload it. What we're looking for here is we're looking at breathing patterns, we're looking at his posture, we're looking at the tempo and speed of the basketball, and we're making sure that the basketball and tennis ball are operating independently. So the, the speed of the tennis ball doesn't dictate the speed of the basketball, and the speed of the basketball doesn't dictate the speed of the tennis ball. Once we see that they can do that, we'll then progress them to the next level. So now we're gonna go with a bounce catch, toss catch. To give you an idea of how detailed we are with this, we're even very specific about the path the ball takes under Stefan's legs. We don't want the ball to go under your glute. We don't want it under your butt. We want it under your knee. We do so much lateral spacing, so if you watch Stefan play during games, he does a lot of spacing side to side. He's either going between his legs or behind his back. The path the ball takes affects his shooting mechanics, so if he doesn't get the ball cleanly from one side of his body to the other, it will affect his shot. The process of acquiring new skills is really is no different than when you learn something in school. So we have to train our brains to learn and absorb. So we have to be strategic about how we stimulate the brain, make sure we understand how long maximum stimulation lasts. It's kind of like watching the same television show over and over again. And, you know, if you watch one episode of a show that's really funny, the third time you see it, it's not as funny. The fourth time you see it, you can recite every word. The fifth time you see it, there's no stimulation whatsoever. We watch heart rate, we watch just body mechanics, we watch all those things to make sure we're in an optimal learning environment at all times. Once we notice that his breathing pattern is normal and he's not compensating or he's not holding his breath because that's the first place that we see neuromuscular overload occur is withholding this breath, we then will progress to the next drill. 
So we're going from controlling the toss, controlling the bounce ourselves, to now we have to react to things off the wall. We're using the tennis ball and the overload to judge how well he's processing information. Having the wall there also allows us the ability to, to take the difficulty level up a little bit higher. With Stefan, we don't do a whole lot of single moves like that. We want him to do a lot of things where it's challenging his speed, challenging his hand-eye coordination, making sure he's, he's coordinated through all the movements. So what we're gonna do now is what we call a toss, cross, cross. So he's gonna toss the tennis ball, cross it twice and catch it with the same hand. So you gotta have very quick hands, very sharp ball handling, and you gotta make sure you're processing information because this is very easy to get overloaded here. So now the way we progress this, because footwork is so very, very important to Stefan, we now add a footwork element to it. We call this a scissor foot. So this is probably in terms of difficulty, kind of top of the line. So now we're gonna have one player, one open hand, two tennis balls. So it's almost like juggling with one hand while you're dribbling with the other hand. So this is the ultimate in terms of being able to process information and handle the basketball at the same time. So this is a decision-making drill. So the ability to handle the basketball, have all this external stimulus going on and execute is no different than making decisions late in games. When he's in tight situations, he's a little bit fatigued. There's other really good players on the floor, guys trying to guard him, and he's got to make the right decision to either pass the ball or take a shot. So the overload of the tennis ball, the overload of the second basketball, all those things are overloading what would be easier with one basketball. So if you took the crossover, you take the tennis ball away, all of a sudden the basketball feels faster, it feels easier. The first place we look for the overload is with the mouth and the breathing. Sometimes you'll see them, you know, they'll lick their lips or they'll, they'll clench their jaws really tight or they'll, they'll close their mouth. The next place you kind of look is you'll see them start to bounce or you see them start to rock back and forth. Then you can look at their hips. Their hips start to do funny things or their knees start to go what we call valgus. The hard part with Stefan is he's so intelligent. He's so good with all these drills. I'm constantly having to come up with new things to try to challenge him and stimulate him. But one of the things that we still battle with Stefan on is on the two ball dribbling. He likes to get into what we call a hinge position where he gets his nose out in front of his toes. That's something where I see it sometimes on TV when I'm out at games and it, it kind of drives me crazy because he knows better. But a lot of trainers are really maybe falling short in that category of understanding how important paying attention to mechanics and little things on stationary drills, how that really affects things on the floor. Continuing with our activation and now blending ball handling with footwork, so important to our, our players, especially Stefan, to have very clean and efficient footwork. So one of the ways we work on that is with the footwork ladder. So traditional agility ladder stuff is done without a basketball, but since we're dealing with point guards and we're dealing with ball skills, we want to mix the basketball into our footwork ladder. We're looking at breathing patterns to make sure that the player is not so overloaded that they're not breathing. We're also looking for fluidity, just movement of the hands, movement of the feet, making sure that everything is moving together and moving quickly, okay? So the next one we're going to go to is called a shuffle hop. And a shuffle hop is where we really have to focus and we really have to concentrate. This is where we're going to look at the foot patterns because we want to be quick, but we want to be efficient. The Probably the biggest mistake we see players make on the ladder is they take extra steps or extra tap steps, and that essentially slows you down because every extra step we take is another step a defender gets the opportunity to get in front of us. The way the Warriors play, they're very spread out. There's a lot of movement involved and you can't really turn your head from side to side to see what's going on on both sides. So he's gotta be able to see all that in one field of vision. So having the ability to help and train that with the virtual reality has become very important to us because it gives us another way to improve without having to move too much. There's several different types of drills or games that he plays, and those games last 10 to 15 minutes. Sometimes there's objects that are moving towards him, and he has multiple objects. He's got to select a specific one. Sometimes there's multiple objects, and he has to multitask within this. Basically, it's just a way to where we're training decision-making. I think what he's improved with the most is his ability to create space. And the one thing that he's done over the last really six or seven years is he has now become a master of controlling his defender, putting them in the position that he wants them to be in in order to get to the space where he knows the shot is.
So for Stefan to create space and for Stefan to keep the ball safe when he's driving to the basket, we have to make sure that our shoulders are getting to the inside of our defender's chest. So we call it the chest battle. If I can get my shoulder to the middle of my defender's chest, the ball's protected and I'm playing with leverage. So with this drill, we wanna make sure that he's twisting and turning his shoulders as the ball is going between his legs. So all these drills, we can add footwork, we add numbers, we add reactionary elements. You have to be able to handle the ball, you have to be able to make decisions, you gotta be able to make shots off of it. Okay, one of the training tools that we use and is highly effective with Steph is the Vertimax. And what the Vertimax does for us is it allows us to add a little bit of external resistance to each movement. So not only does it help us with our movement in terms of our acceleration and our deceleration, but it also helps us learn things in a quicker manner. So adding light loading to a movement really aids in muscle memory and it helps us absorb what we're doing. And it's very important for a guy like Stefan that stops and starts and changes direction a lot. We really have to train his decelerating patterns just as much if not more than his accelerating patterns because we have to be able to change directions efficiently and mechanically sound. Just like with the other drills, anytime we're trying to get Stefan to learn something quick, we're trying to add something new to his game, a quick way for us to help him learn it is to hook him up to the Vertimax and have him go through that move specifically four or five times and we'll take him off of it. We'll go right to the court, go right into that drill and he'll be able to execute it smoothly, a lot more fluidly than he could if we didn't use this machine. He was the first guy to really recognize that, well, if I can't get by the guy in front of me, there's always space behind me. I think that he's kind of um, revolutionized basketball in that way. You know, my 11-year-old son doesn't really think a whole lot about taking a 22-foot jumper in a game. And, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we would have never let a kid that age take that shot. But basketball is now evolving to that point. And it's all because Stefan has changed it.